This message is brought to you by House on the Rock Fellowship. We are a church that serves and cares for the Miami Valley region in Ohio. Before you continue, make sure to access the notes from our download section of our message page and have your Bible ready. Thank you for being our guest. Good morning. Uh, it's so nice to see you. My name is Paul. To our guests, hello, a very special hello. Uh, I'm a pastor here, elder and teacher. It's Labor Day weekend. Growing up for me, Labor Day meant two things. First, it was the Jerry Lewis MDA telethon. How many of you remember the Jerry Lewis MDA telethon, right? That was awesome. I was allowed to stay up all night and watch the Jerry Lewis MDA telethon. And it was the sketches and it was the skits and it was Jerry Lewis, the comedian and the singer, the actor, the director. It was Ed McMahon and the timpani rolls and the tote board. And it was exciting and it was fun. And oftentimes it was eating food at grandma's house. That was Labor Day. The other part of Labor Day really confused me because that was the day dad didn't go to work. I mean, this doesn't make any sense. It's Labor Day. Dad's not working on Labor Day. There's something clearly about Labor Day I don't understand. I don't get that there's this not working thing, but we call it the working thing. And if you start to peel back the layers, what you find, and I'm sure you know this about Labor Day, I'm sure you're all steeply entrenched in Labor Day doctrine and history, right? Labor Day is not working to remember all those who were working, specifically the working class of America in the 19th century and the protests and the riots and the parades because so much of working in the 19th century in the United States in the Industrial Revolution wasn't working. It wasn't working. Average family could easily put in over 100 hours a week seven days a week, nonstop, trying to make ends meet. And so what started to happen was people began to gather together by trade, by craft, to riot and protest. And there's parades in New York City, the first Labor Day parade. Did you bring a picture up, Carmen? First, that's the first Labor Day parade in New York City. In the 1880s, a craftsmen gathered together, carpenters gathered together, and tin workers and iron workers and, and tanners, all according to their craft, and began this long parade that began a tradition of protest that the way we're working is not working. The way we're working is not working. Riots, Pullman strikes, and Eventually, the government will come along and say, hey, maybe there's a better way of doing this. We take for granted that there's this undergirded idea of an eight-hour work day. Eight hours to work, eight hours to sleep, eight hours to play. Fair pay for a fair day's work. That it was not uncommon for many kids to spend the majority of their day working in the mines, working in the mills so that families could survive. And so a day to remember what working wasn't working. I wonder if there's parts of your life this morning that aren't working. I wonder if there's aspects of your faith that if we were to be honest, you would say, Paul, this isn't working. Paul, my marriage is not working. Paul, my faith's not working. I read the book. I sing the songs. I go to church. There's something that's not there. There's aspects of my being where I labor and I labor and I labor and I don't feel like I'm making any progress. Maybe it's not working because you forgot the one who is working. We're going to talk about that this morning. To help us, let's jump into John chapter 5. We've been in John's gospel, well, the gospel according to John, for about a year, and we're winding down our time there. We've just kind of been reflecting in places here or there. You can go to uh, whoishouseontherock.com to listen to those messages. But in John chapter 5, 
we're introduced to a few scenes where there's three things that aren't working that Jesus steps into to confront, to address. And I'd like to share those with you this morning. John chapter 5, maybe you have a copy of God's Word in front of you, a Bible. Carmen will have verses up on the screen that you can follow along. Maybe you brought a Bible. We're a big fan. Uh, there's Bibles in the seats in front of you. You can take that home if you don't have a copy of God's Word. But we're big fans of the Bible. We don't worship the Bible. We do worship the God the Bible teaches us about. John chapter 5, verse 1. I'm going to read verses 1 through 17. And we're going to unpack three scenes together this morning. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate a pool in Aramaic called Bethesda, which has five roofed colonnades. In these lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, paralyzed. One man was there who had been an invalid for 30 years. Eight years. When Jesus saw him lying there, knew that he'd already been there a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be healed? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. While I am going, another steps down before me. When Jesus said to him, Get up, take up your bed, walk. And at once the man was healed. He took up his bed and walked. Now that day was the Sabbath. All right, so you, that's a big deal. That's like a really, really big deal. So we probably need a little sound effect to go with that. You know how you have a big moment in the movies and there's some music behind it? Like, bum, bum, bum. Maybe that's what we should do when I read this phrase. All right, so let's practice. We're going to go, bum, bum, bum. Ready? One, two. Two, three. So much better than the first service. You guys are so much more advanced than they are. Um, don't tell them I said that. All right, so I'm going to read. Now that day was the Sabbath, and you're going to do your thing. Okay, you ready? Now that day was the Sabbath. It wasn't that was a little sloppy? That was that was kind of. Let's try it one more time. Ready? Now that day was the Sabbath. <laughs> so Jesus said to the man who had been healed, it is the Sabbath. <laughs> All right, that's awesome. Great. Great. Don't, don't do it again. You'll mess me up. And it's not lawful for you to take up your bed. But he answered them. The man who healed me said to me, take up your bed and walk. Well, they asked him, who is this man who said you take up your bed and walk? Now the man who had been healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn, and there was a crowd in the place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you're well. Sin no more, that nothing worse may happen to you. The man went away, told the Jews it was Jesus who had healed him. This is why the Jews were persecuting Jesus, because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, my father is working until now, and I am working. Jesus is working. When nothing else works, Jesus is working. Maybe we could talk about that this morning. First, let's look at this first scene. Here's a man. And I know in sermons past, we've talked about this man before, and you can go back and listen to those messages. But here's a man, an invalid, who had been placed by these waters and sat there, lied there, forsaken, forgotten for 38 years. Nothing was working for this man. He was not getting better. He was not an picture of an image bearer of God by any means. Maybe his family had dumped him there. Maybe his family visited once every now and then. But here's a man who wasn't working, whose life wasn't working. Something's broken. And so I began to reflect on what is it about this man's situation that keeps him where he is? And maybe that will help some of us this morning. I don't think that everything I'm going to say this morning applies to everybody here. But maybe one of these scenes 
will meet you where you're at. And maybe this first scene is for you. What is it that keeps this man where he is? I think it's the lies that he chooses to believe. There are three lies that this man holds on to. I think there are three lies that it's easy for all of us to hold on to. In verse 7, when Jesus asked him the question, do you want to be healed? I don't know of too many people who don't want to be better, who don't want a vibrant life, an abundant life. Do you want that? The man says to Jesus, sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. And while I'm going, another steps down before me. What lies? Sir, I have no one. That's a lie. I'm alone in this. That's a lie. I am alone in my crisis. I am alone in my problem. No one is with me. No one is next to me. I've got this all on my shoulders. I am alone. What a lie. No wonder his life isn't working for him. He's convinced he's doing it by himself. He's convinced that there isn't anyone who sees him, who knows, who is drawn near. Maybe that's a lie you're familiar with. I'm all by myself. The second lie. To put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. There was, for some reason, a superstition that surrounded this pool. Don't know where it's rooted or where it came from. Archaeologists, theologians, historians can't unpack. But there seemed to be some pop culture myth that when the plumbing backed up around this pool... The bubbles were an angel, a healing angel that was coming down. And first come, first serve. If you hop in the magic angel water, you'll be better. There is nothing in Scripture anywhere that testifies to the fact that in the pool of Bethesda, when the waters stir up, an angel will heal you. What a lie. If I could just get my hands on that thing, it would take care of everything. If I could just get a hold of this, if I could go to that, if I could have this thing, give me a bottle of magic angel water and my mess would be so much better. A lie of culture, a lie of community, a lie of the times. Buy this, order this, get this, and it'll take care of it. $9.95, as seen on TV. Ever buy into that lie? Ever buy into that lie? If I just had that thing, everything would be better. While I'm going, another steps down before me. First, it was the lie of isolation. Secondly, it was the lie of possession. Thirdly, it's the lie of progress. If I just tried harder, if I just worked harder, if I just did more, then it would work out. If I could get there first, if I could sweat a little bit more, wake up a little bit earlier, leave a little bit more on the field, then maybe I'd get what I need to fix the problem I'm in. If I was just a better me, this wouldn't be a problem. What a lie. You know it's a lie because I is right in the middle of it. Me this, I that. If I were better, then parenting would be easier. If I were better, then this marriage would be working out. If I were better, then the bills would become a little bit closer. If I were better, things weren't so so difficult. What lies this man believes. None of that is working for him. In fact, it's taken and stolen 38 years of his life. That's not working, but who is working? 
Who is working in this? Notice where Jesus is in this situation. He, this is the city of Jerusalem. This is the sparkling, shimmering jewel of the Jewish people, rich with the Temple Mount and the Roman architecture and the marketplace. It is vibrant. It is joyful. It is celebration. And then Jesus is in none of those places. Jesus is in the stenchy, stinky cesspool where the forsaken, the broken, and the invalids of culture have been dumped by their families so they can fester and stink in the summer sun under the lie that if they hop in the magic water, everything will be better. And it's in that place where it seems that all have forgotten that grace draws near. And Jesus sees the man, comes up to the man, speaks to the man. Do you want to be better? What a gracious question. What an amazing question. You have to remember, this guy has no idea who, who's talking to him. He doesn't know this is Jesus. He doesn't know this is the incarnate son of God. He knows none of those things. He got no good theology, no bad theology. He don't go to church on Sunday mornings. He don't load up the plate. He don't serve in the nursery. He got nothing going for him at all. Because that's grace. That's what grace is. Grace draws near and asks, do you want to be better? Do you want to be healed? Amidst all the lies, the one who is the way, the truth, and the life comes up to him. What grace. Maybe things aren't working for you because you forgot the one who's working. So Jesus says, get up. And then Jesus says this, pick up your bed. Now, I got a little caught by that phrase. There's a, a musicality to it. In fact, the way that John has written it, it's a little bit of a repeating theme that comes back again and again and again because there's a couple other things that aren't working and Jesus is literally going to trigger a religious riot. He is intentionally going to push people's buttons. Yes, Jesus will do that to you. Yes, Jesus will trigger you. Pick up your bed. Listen to this. I'm going to read from verse 8 down through verse 13. And just don't do that ba 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 thing. You're going to jam me up, okay? Okay? It was a fun gag. We're, we're moving on. We've grown up now. Okay, ready? Listen, 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 listen with, with a musical ear. Jesus said to him, get up. Take up your bed and walk. And at once the man was healed, and he took up his bed and walked. Now that day was the Sabbath. So the Jews said to the man who had been healed, It's the Sabbath. It's not lawful for you to take up your bed. But he answered them, The man who healed me said to me, Take up your bed and walk. Then they asked him, Who is the man who said to you, Take up your bed and walk? Like this repeated refrain, this melody, John keeps bringing back again and again, healed, Sabbath, take up your bed, take up your bed, take up your bed, take up your bed. Because you see, it was the Sabbath. The Sabbath was a hallmark, a distinguishing mark of the Jewish faith. It was the seventh day, Saturday, as we would understand it. A day of ceasing, a day of resting. The sun goes down Friday night, and you cease. That's what the word literally means, the Shabbat, to cease, to stop, to rest. And you don't work. It's commanded. The whole country did it. Everyone did it. And there were laws surrounding what you could and could not do. And you could not carry a heavy load on the Sabbath. The very thing that Jesus commanded the man to do. The Sabbath is commanded in two specific places, in Exodus and Deuteronomy, where the Ten Commandments are given. The fourth commandment, you shall remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. In Exodus and Deuteronomy, you're given two different reasons for why you're to keep this command. One has to do with creation. For in six days, the Lord made creation. On the seventh day, he rested. It is a picture and a reminder in Sabbath that you are to remember your creator, that you are to remember he is your source of life. 
The other reason that Sabbath is commanded in the other set of 10 is that for you were slaves in Egypt and the Lord delivered you. Sabbath is a signpost of the creator and of our deliverance from slavery. It's the outline, if you will. It's a silhouette of a shape. And you are to fill that with God's deliverance and God's creation. And what John wants to see is, and you're to fill that with Jesus. When a Jew saw Sabbath, he was to, to see it fulfilled in Jesus. That's why repeatedly in the beginning of John's gospel, Jesus starts to poke at things. He starts to poke at the temple. Hey, you know what? I'm the temple. He starts poking at purification laws. You know who purifies? I purify. He starts to poke at holy days and, and feasts. And he says, I'm that. That's me. Then he comes to Sabbaths. Maybe the most revered, most respected, and most commanded, and most kept. I'm the Sabbath. I'm the Sabbath. But they had twisted it and they turned it into something else. Instead of it being a hallmark and a sign to rejoice and rest in God's creation, in God's deliverance, it became something that you pummeled the other person with. And so Jesus triggers it. He says, let's talk about rest. Let's talk about creation and renewal. Let's talk about me in the midst of all of that. So Jesus doesn't say to the man, get up and walk home. He says, get up, pick up your bed and walk home. This isn't like some yoga roll or a sleeping bag. This is probably a large wooden pallet that this man spent his whole life on to keep him up off the grime and the filth of the stone. It would have been a large wooden pallet. Very noticeable. So imagine if you will, Jesus says, hey, pick that up, that big heavy thing, and take it home. And then John says, oh, by the way, this is the Sabbath. So here he is lumbering down the street with this big wooden, dragging this big wooden, carrying this big wooden pallet. And all the Jews come out like ants to sugar, like bees to honey. What are you doing? You can't do that. It's the Sabbath. Who told you to do that? Yeah, I, don't, I, I, I have no idea. I don't know. The guy told me to do it. I can walk now. <laughs> like, hadn't walked in 38 years. I asked myself, well, what do we do with this passage about Sabbath? We're not Jews. We're, we're Gentiles. We're not commanded to keep Sabbath. Like they're commanded to keep Sabbath. But we do have, don't we, a habit, a way of life that's to define our faith. Don't we have things that we are to be about and a way that we're to do them? And is it perhaps a possibility that some of those things could stop working because we stopped filling them with the one who works? That we can come on Sunday morning and it cannot be about Jesus. We can open the Bible and it could not be about Jesus that we could pray and it stops being about Jesus. We could give and it stops being about Jesus. We can serve and it stops being about Jesus. When it stops being about Jesus, it stops working. And then it becomes a burden and it becomes a weight. It becomes something that crushes us. It's hilarious. Jesus does this prophetic thing where he has this guy carry his bed. I mean, what do you do on your bed? You sleep on your bed. You rest on your bed. In the same way that the Sabbath, the rest had become a burden, Jesus says, hey, pick up your bed, which is the symbol of your rest, and carry it like it's a burden now. Maybe you feel that there's various aspects of your faith that just aren't working. And so... You stop doing them. Be perfectly honest, it's not my fault. You can blame me, that's fine. I'm a big boy, I'll sleep tonight. You stopped praying, you stopped reading, you stopped attending regularly, you stopped serving, you stopped giving. And they stopped working because you stopped filling them with the one who works. You stopped making it about Jesus. What if, what, what if, 
What if you gathered on Sunday morning with the sole purpose of worshiping Jesus and learning about Jesus and praising Jesus and, and thanking Jesus? What if you made Sunday morning about Jesus? What if when you opened your Bible, it wasn't just to check the I'm a good Christian box, but it was actually to learn something about Jesus and grow in relationship with Jesus and be confronted with parts of you that aren't about Jesus? What if you made Bible reading about Jesus? What if when you prayed, you made a prayer about seeking Jesus' face and becoming like Jesus in your way of life? What if when the offering plate went by, you made it about giving to the kingdom of Jesus? I'm so excited. Some of you know we had a church meeting uh, last week and I said some things in a serious way. And over 25 people stepped up to serve. Yeah. Now for those of you who aren't serving, that's not one of those, oh, good, got it covered, fine. <laughs> I was hoping if I waited long enough that... Uh, We'd be good to go. <laughs> Time that one well, didn't I? <laughs> no. You and I still have issues. And yes, I know who you are. Yeah, these people who stepped up to serve, some of them not serving at all, some of them who had quit serving, some of them who are coming back to deeper levels of service. Uh, thank you for doing that. And my challenge to you, make it about Jesus. Make it about Jesus. So if you're opening a door, man, you do it for Jesus. And if you're making coffee, you make it for Jesus. And if you're serving in the nursery, you're doing it for Jesus. He who works, work as unto the Lord. And if you do that, I promise you will always go home renewed, rested, and excited, and vibrant with life because it was about Jesus. Maybe parts of your faith aren't working because you stopped making it about the one who works. There's one more scene and one more moment in this section of Scripture that I, I would draw our attention to, and that comes in verse 14. Verse 14. Afterward, Jesus found the man that he had healed in the temple and said to him, See, you're well. Sin no more that nothing worse may happen to you. Sin no more. I gotta be honest. Your sin, it's not working. It's not working for you. Your secret, your shame, it's not working. It's not working for you. A little bit later in this exact same chapter, if you were to jump ahead in your copy of scriptures to verse 24, I'm going to read 24 down through 29. 24 down through 29. Jesus gives a warning. Truly, truly, anytime Jesus says truly, truly, I mean, it's enough that it's the son of God who created you and died for you. It's like everything he says is important. But when he says truly, truly, it's like, hey, McFly, this matters. This is important. Bum, bum, bum. Yeah, truly, truly. You're like, oh, oh. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but is passed from death to life. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil 
to the resurrection of judgment. I don't know why Jesus drops this verse in here, why he says this to the man. But there is a contrast. If you look at, um, like in chapter nine, Jesus heals a blind man. And the whole preface to that is a conversation about sin. Jesus is asked, who sinned that this guy's blind? Did he sin or did his parents sin? Jesus is like, this has nothing to do with sin. This situation has nothing to do with sin. But in this situation of healing, there is a conversation about sin. Jesus says, hey, I made you better physically. Are you better spiritually? Are you healed spiritually? Sin no more that nothing worse may happen to you, for judgment is coming. I would tell you, your sin is not working for you. And if you have never come with forgiveness hands and a forgiveness face and forgiveness knees before Jesus, your sin is not working for you. So what isn't working this morning? You know you. Is there some lie that you've grabbed a hold of? A lie that says things like this. I'm alone. No one gets me. No one knows. I'm all by myself. Is it the lie that believes if we just buy that thing, drink that thing, eat that thing, do that thing, it'll make it all better? If we just go here and do that, then it'll be fine. If I could just get my kid to one more competition, if I could just get my kid one more trophy, then they'll be happy and everything will be great and I'll be a good parent. I love that one. I see that one a lot. Don't forget that one of the underarching drives behind the labor movement in the 19th century was the unjust treatment of children. Did you know that? Children. This is children in the Lackawanna coal mines of Pennsylvania. See, they can fit places and go places and do things that adults can't. And so adults would conscript them to work in the mines and work at the mills and work at the tanneries and to work at the looms, little fingers whittling away, little hearts pounding, little lives whittling off. And yet, parents, we will do the exact same thing to our children under the name of trophies and happiness and competitions. And we will take them here and we will take them there and we will run them to the bone because if our kids are winners, then everyone will know we're good parents. And we will sacrifice our kids' lives on the altars of our own insecurities. Oh, that doesn't work. That does not work. You take those lives and you ambassador the gospel to them and you fill those lives with Jesus. You fill their lives with Jesus. I'm excited to start a new parenting class. And I know some people are like, I'm not going to a parenting class. People think I'm not a good parent. That's like saying I'm not going to church because I don't want people to think I'm not a good Christian. I'm like, yeah, go to the parenting class. Fool, what's wrong with you? I pity the fool. Because what we find out is Really being a good parent is about being a good follower of Christ. That if I want grace in my kids' lives, I need grace in my life. If I want them to understand that there is such a thing as commandment and law, then I need to model and live under commandment and law. That there are things that are right and are wrong. 
And so we have a responsibility to ambassador to them a kingdom of God and a better way of life. And so we're going to have those signups open for one more week. Uh, excuse me, one more Sunday. You can sign out in the atrium and there's a book that you can purchase and we'll begin this Wednesday. I'd love to see you there. I'd love to see you there. Um, fill your habits with Jesus. Bring your sins to Jesus. If you ask people who know things about literature and theater, what's the greatest American play ever written? Well, most people will tell you it's Thornton Wilder's Our Town. Are you guys familiar with that play? Thornton Wilder's Our Town. It's the greatest American play ever written. It's a simple play, three acts. It's about everyday life. First act's about living. Second act's about loving. Third act is, anyone want to guess what the third act's about? It's about dying. That's right. It's a very simple, bare stage. There's no set. There's no scenery. Maybe a couple chairs and tables that are used by the stage manager who helps people understand the story as it unfolds in front of them. It kind of traces the lives of two families, the Webbs and the Gibbs, and really their eldest child in each family, George Gibbs and Emily Webb. And George and Emily grow up next to each other in the first act. And guess what happens in the second act? High school sweethearts, and they fall in love, and you see their wedding. And as you watch the story and as you see it unpack, you endear yourself to them because this is our town. This is our story. This is about making breakfast in the morning, and this is about going to work, and this is about falling in love. These are the things of life. But then the third act comes. And very quickly we're confronted with something that we don't like to remember. That there's something eternal about life. You see, when it opens on act three, there's a series of chairs, rows of chairs that are set up. Like it's a cemetery and people who have died sit in those chairs. And act three is a conversation that the dead have amongst themselves. And what we find out via the narrator, the stage manager, is that Emily died in childbirth to their second child. And the funeral procession brings and comes and Emily comes and Emily sits in one of the chairs. And she still struggles between what is life and what is death. But what she starts to realize is that the living just don't get it. And repeatedly will say to others, they don't understand, do they? No, the living do not understand. And then Emily says, I could go back, couldn't I? Can I go back for a day? Don't do it. Don't do it. But I could go back for, for just a day. Don't do it. Don't do it. And so... Emily goes back and she lives one day and she comes back completely crushed because in truth, the living just don't get it. And to set all of this up, the stage manager helps us enter into the message of death and what is eternal and what really matters. Really, the whole play is about death. And I wanted to read to you just a couple words as you think about your lies, as you think about your faith, as you think about what's not working and the one who does. Now, there are some things we all know, but we don't take them out and look at them very often. We all know that something is eternal, and it ain't houses, it ain't names, it ain't earth, it ain't even the stars. Everybody knows in their bones something is eternal and something has to do with human beings. All the greatest people ever lived have been telling us that for 5,000 years, yet you'd be surprised how people are always losing hold of it. There's something way down deep that's eternal about every human being. 
You know as well as I do that the dead don't stay interested in us living people very long. Gradually, gradually, they lose hold of the earth. The ambition that they had, the pleasures that they had, the things they suffered, people that they loved. They get weaned away from earth. That's, that's the way I put it, uh, weaned away. And they stay here while that earth part of them burns away and burns out. And all that time, they slowly get indifferent to what's going on in town below. They're waiting. They're waiting for something that they feel is coming. And it's something important. And it's something great. Aren't they waiting for that eternal part in them to come out clear? Some of the things that they're going to say maybe will hurt your feelings, and that's just the way it is. Mother and daughter, husband, wife, enemy and enemy, money and miser, all those terribly important things kind of just grow pale around here. Maybe in our passage this morning, A future version of you, a version of you on the other side of death has tried to come back and whisper something in your ears. That's not as important as you think it is. That doesn't matter as much as you think it matters. Oh, you just don't understand. That's not working. Remember the one who works. Thank you for sharing your time with us, and we'd love for the journey to continue. If you're a guest, would you consider reaching out to us? We would love to come alongside and encourage you in any way that we can. If you're someone who's joined us today, and you are desperately reaching to find hope wherever you can. Again, Jesus came that we would find hope. You can find hope today. If you want to send us a short note, a member of our hope team would reach out quickly, promptly, to come alongside and see what we can do to encourage you in whatever storm you might find yourself in. That's why Jesus came. And that's why we're here. Jesus said there's two ways to live your life. And a wise man, a wise woman, builds their life on Jesus' instructions. God bless.